Marshall Goldsmith educa executivos há mais de 50 anos. Ele foi eleito o pensador de liderança mais importante pelo Thinkers 50, que elege os maiores especialistas da gestão no mundo. Ele também escreveu 40 livros sobre gestão, tendo três deles ficado entre os mais vendidos na lista do New York Times. Ele foi professor do Dartmouth College e também é uma das maiores referências globais como coach de altos executivos, tendo trabalhado com CEOs da Pfizer, Claxo, Banco Mundial, entre muitos outros. Este ano, Goldsmith está lançando um novo livro, The Earned Life, no qual aconselha executivos a deixarem o arrependimento para trás e olharem para as conquistas na vida profissional. E é sobre este livro e também sobre o futuro da liderança que vamos estar conversando com ele hoje. Marshall Goldsmith, it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. Considering your book, why do regrets stop us from moving on in our professional lives? Yeah, one of the things I talk about in the book is the concept of impermanence. And that when we take a breath, it's a new me. And the importance of looking at ourselves as constantly recreating our lives and not getting lost in the past. When we feel regrets and think a lot about our past, we're actually living someone else's life. We're not living our life in the present. You speak that not to regret is not to forgive ourselves uh, for our mistakes, for example. But when we, we, we don't regret things, we forgive others for their mistakes also. So uh, do, you, do you think this is a healthy behavior that should be encouraged in organizations? Oh, definitely, definitely, because the reality is you can't change the past. And to the degree that organizations can get people to focus on the future more than the past, they're better off. One thing I teach in all of my classes is feed forward. And in feed forward, you get feedback about the past as a base. But after that, everything is focused on the future. What can you change? Not revisiting constantly what you did wrong. So, and feed forward is a very proven tool. We have a research study from 86,000 people that shows when leaders get feedback, they pick important behavior to improve, they talk to people, they follow up and they practice feed forward, they become more effective, not as judged by themselves, but as judged by the people around them. Well, in, a, in modern society, Marshall, we used to value the most uh, merited success. Where right. we set a target, we work hard and we earn. We value that more than small goals that guarantee our reputation along our career. So mm -hmm. do you agree with that? And is, it, is that something that we should reconsider? Well, I think very important not to get overly focused on results, never to place your value as a human being based on results for two reasons. One, you don't have total control over results. Results are a factor of many variables, some of which you may control, some of which you may not. Two, what happens after you achieve results? Well, after we achieve results, we get a short-term sense of satisfaction, which lasts how long? A week, a month? And if you value yourself as a human being based upon results, you invariably have problems. One of the brilliant people that I work with is named Safi Bacall. He was in a group of people I met with over COVID, 60 great leaders. Uh, Safi, brilliant man, wrote a book called Loon Shots, worth tens of millions of dollars, started companies, consulted to presidents. He said he finally realized something. He taught, he's a scientist, PhD in physics from Stanford, and he said he used to believe that happiness was dependent upon achievement. And if he achieved, he would be happy. He finally realized, no, happiness and achievement are independent variables. You can achieve a lot and be happy. You can achieve a lot and be miserable. You can achieve nothing and be happy. You can achieve nothing and be miserable. The great Western disease is I will be happy when I get the money, status, BMW, condominium. I will be happy when. The reality is that's not true. That is not true. Happiness has to be now and it's in the moment and it's a constant process. It's not you get to a place. There's a certain book that always has the same ending and they lived happily ever after. That's called a fairy tale. That's not the real world. 
I agree with you. Sometimes uh, we feel dissatisfied so quickly about something we worked so hard to earn or to a promotion, a deal, an election, as right. you said in the book. And how can we make this sense of fulfillment and happiness last in our career? Well, let's make an assumption. Let's assume that you're healthy, because my book doesn't address that. That you have good relationships with people you love. The book doesn't address that. And you have a middle class income. And most people, I, not most, all people I work with have plenty of money. So let's assume those are taken care of. What matters in life? Only three things. One, you have a higher aspiration. You're striving for something. You have a reason why. Why are you doing this hard work? Two, your achievements are connected to this higher aspiration. You're achieving important things that are related to this. And three, you love the process of what you're doing. To the degree you can align, I'm doing something that's important to me. I'm making real achievement and I enjoy the process you just won the game of life. That, that is the big game of life. Now, in the history of the world, most people were fixated on the action phase, the day-to-day -day activities. Our ancestors didn't have a lot of choices. They had to do what was in front of them. And that's not bad or good. It just was. Some people are focused in their head, you know, aspiration, dreams. They never achieve anything, but they dream a lot. The people I work with and the people who read you are achievers. They're focused on achieving goals. And if they're not careful, they get so focused on achieving goals, they forget why they're achieving the goals in the first place. And two, they may or may not enjoy the process of life. So very important to look at achievement relative to why am I doing this? And am I enjoying the process of the achievement itself? My question is, can we pursue a purpose in business without pursuing a purpose in our own lives? It's very important to connect the purpose of why are you working and the purpose of your life. Uh, my friend, in fact, Hubert Jolie wrote a book about this called The Heart of Business that talks about the importance of connecting the purpose as a human and the purpose of what we're doing. If we don't connect the purpose of what we're doing, a lot of our lives is work. If we don't collect, connect our lives to some form of purpose, why are we doing it? One gentleman I talk about in the book said, I worked 80 hours a week for 40 years. He was the CEO of a huge company. I worked 80 hours a week for 40 years with one goal. So my children would never have to do this. Then he said, that was the worst thing I could have ever done for myself, for my wife, or for my children. I didn't help my children. I didn't help my wife and I didn't help myself. It was a waste. Well, you got to say, why am I doing this? Why am I putting in this effort? Why am I trying so hard? You need a reason and you need to enjoy the process. You need to enjoy the process of life because my research indicates one thing. I don't know if you know this. We're all going to be equally dead. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> We're all going to be equally dead. And if you don't enjoy the process of life, you're going to look back and say, what was that about? I think uh, we can blame some somehow the companies because they used to set goals to professionals. But as they reach them, the expectation gets higher for the next goal, for the next month, the next period. Do, do you believe acting this way, companies are perpetuating unfulfillment and unhappiness? Because, or should workers learn how to deal with these brief moments of fulfillment at work? Well, no, number one, those are false moments of fulfillment because they don't last. And then number two, that's not going to change. Let me give you an extreme example. One of the people who endorsed my book is named Albert Berla. Albert's the CEO of Pfizer. I said to Albert, how was your year last year? Whoa, pretty good, you know, vaccine for the COVID. We uh, made lots of money and the CEO of the year and employee engagement and everything. I said, what's your biggest challenge? He said, I have a huge challenge next year. Next year. <laughs> That's not going to change. That's never going to go away. There's always going to be another challenge. The key is you enjoy the process of what you're doing without becoming psychologically attached to the results. If your value is you always have to do better than last year, you're never going to win. What must be, um, in your opinion, a good reflection for executives about the future after all we have experienced it in these two years? Number one, it's lonely at the top. Now, it used to be lonely at the top. Now it is lonelier at the top. 
the executives that I've spent the COVID period with every weekend are among 50 of the top leaders in the world. And they, it's lonely. Why? Anything they say can be taken out of context, put on social media. People can laugh at them. It's hard. One person said, it's nice to spend one hour a week when I can just act like a human being. It's very, very hard. I think it's important that executives have a support group of people to help them, people to talk to, people they can be human with, people they can share ideas with. And it's tough because if anything gets out publicly, boom, you can be in major trouble. Another thing is for leaders, I wrote an article in Chief Executive Magazine. The average leader, I think, is better and better and better, and their feedback is worse and worse and worse. Why? The expectations are so different. The expectations have gone up. People feel free to express their opinion. And as leaders have approved, have improved, the expectations for these leaders have ex exceeded even more, which makes leaders more and more subject to criticism than ever before. So I think being a leader is critically important today more than ever. What makes a very successful leader sometimes feel like an imposter? What causes it is the belief that it's not the real me. You see, we have this image that we carry around through life called the real me. That's who I really am. And we need to work on changing this image sometimes. Let's say you think, well, the real me is someone who's not that smart. Yet you get feedback from everybody that you're incredibly smart. You know what you're going to think? Well, that's not the real me. They just think I'm smart. The real me isn't that way. I have to work on this with my coaching clients a lot. And I teach them, that's what the whole book is about. The you that's here now is the real you. The you that's here now is the real you. The you that these people are talking to now is the real you. The people that think you're great, they think the real you now is great. That doesn't mean the previous you was great but they're not talking to the previous you. They're talking to the you that's here and don't put yourself in a box where you're still living in a previous version of yourself. Sometimes you think about fulfillment and you, you can, you, can, you said uh, people from Wall Street, they got money, they got power, they're recognized and somehow they feel okay with that. Could you comment that? Why, why do you say that in your book? Yeah, I have an example in my book of a Wall Street guy who's very happy with his life, loves what he's doing, feels like he's making a meaningful contribution to the world. Well, you know what? No one can tell any human being what is meaningful for them. The answer to what is meaningful for me comes from one place in our heart. And by the way, you can see people like my friend Gary Ridge was the CEO of WD-40. They make lubricants. They had the highest employee engagement scores in the United States. People there felt their work was more meaningful than people in a children's hospital. Well, it's pretty hard to say a guy making lubricants is more important than somebody curing cancer for a little child. On the other hand, they felt meaning. They felt their work was meaningful. They created meaning every day. So the definition of meaning the definition of happiness doesn't come from the outside. It comes from the inside. Thank you very much, Marshall, for your time. Thank you for having us and to give this a great, uh, great reflections for our executives. Thank you so much.